in terms of my career progression, um, I'm an entrepreneur. If I had to give myself a label as to what my career is right now, I would say I'm an entrepreneur. And that means that I'm always looking for opportunities to solve problems. Whether those problems are big or small or whether they're local or regional or global, you know, entrepreneurs are in the business of solving problems. So now we're here in this digital era where what that represents to me as an entrepreneur is that we have this amazing opportunity to use technology tools to solve problems. So if you're, if you're a problem solver for the last 10 years, last 15 years, last 20 years, for your entire life, now you're in a great position to solve problems because technology is this great enabler of problem solving. So my career path right now is fully focused on how I can deploy technology to solving problems within the context of my entrepreneurial journey. Well, my passion for technology comes from my passion for efficiency. So um, I believe that we're all trying to become more efficient. Think about it. The, the reason we don't ride horses places anymore is because we recognize that a car is more efficient. It's a more efficient means of transportation. So as soon as the automobile came on the scenes, what did we do? We stopped using horses. Tractors and mechanization for farming, as soon as they appeared, we stopped using manual implements and tools to do farming. So in every part of life, the minute technology appears, what it represents is efficiency, a way for us to do something with less labor, with less effort. And so for me, my attraction to technology is around my need to try to improve things, my need to try to make things better, my need to make things more efficient. Um, I don't think there's a better way to bring efficiency into people's lives than through technology. And that's really the purpose of technology. So for me, um, you know, when I think of tech, I'm always thinking of the most efficient way that we have available to us today to get something done. And I know I'm very acutely aware of the, the other side of that argument, which is the fear side. People get very fearful when they hear that because they're thinking displacement, they're thinking, I won't have a job, I won't have, I won't know what to do, how am I going to function in this new world that's, that becomes more efficient. Um, but that's, we can discuss that down, down the road, but I think that, that fear is misplaced. I think more opportunities will come from the technological efficiencies than, than displacement, frankly. Yeah. So that's what drives me. Right, so I have a background in financial services. I've been uh, in financial services for um, since the, the early 90s, really. Um, not in technology, but just in the business of financial services. So I understood it well. And I also understood the massive inefficiencies in that business. Um, without going into the, the history of financial services, it comes out of a, a, a past that is very siloed, right? Banks and financial services businesses in general operated in, in silos. Um, but it wasn't until much later that they started having cross, um, sort of, uh, you know, cross-pollinating businesses. Like insurance could, you know, a bank could then do insurance and they could do regular banking and they could do investments all in one. But before, it wasn't that way. So banks came up in these silos. And what that meant is that as banks started, when I say banks, I'm really just using that term broadly to mean financial services. So as financial services came up, as they tried to do more for their customers, they started realizing that the siloed nature of their operational infrastructure uh, and their architectures were, was preventing them from actually delivering on all the things that they wanted to do for their customers. Now, we're still, even today, financial services are still dealing with that, you know, the, the legacy of that siloed structure that they started with. And so when you look at where can you solve big uh, inefficiencies, uh, financial services was one of the places that, you know, was, was, was a glaring example of that. And given the fact that I had prior business experience in financial services, it seemed like a natural fit for me. 
to focus my attention around solving the problems that I saw where technology could add more efficiencies. Financial services just seemed like the natural fit for me uh, to, to sort of focus on. So that's why I got into FinTech generally. Well, you know, the impact always begins with success. Failures can't impact anybody really. Um, and people don't remember those. So the first impact is for us to have a successful business, a successful business in numbers, right? Not just a successful business sort of qualitatively, but we need to have a successful business quantitatively. And the reason that's important is because success then allows people to take notice. It gives you a credible story to tell. And credibility is important when you're trying to uh, inspire people, when you're trying to provide an example for people, when you're trying to uh, help to um, generate interest in a nascent industry like the industry we're in, um, when you're trying to help move and inspire younger people to see technology as a viable economic alternative for them. Right, a way they can improve their lives. So all of that requires credible success. So the first thing I want to do with my business is, is to make sure that it's a credible success. Once it's a credible success, then my focus uh, first, even though we're a global business, we do business, uh, we have customers you know, outside of Jamaica. Um, my initial focus is to make sure that our business acts as a model and an example here in Jamaica for uh, younger folks who are coming up who want to get into technology and may not really understand how to get into a SaaS business. You'll hear me use that term SaaS, software as a service, which is the, the business that we're in and, and the model that we use for distributing our software. Um, people who want to get into that space will need some credible examples of success. They will need somebody who has traveled that path. They'll need somebody who understands the journey and they will need some advice and some counsel. Um, and we think that if we can be a credible success, we can be all those things and more for local Jamaican entrepreneurs who want to get into the tech space. Clearly, we can also be a model for regional, um, a, a regional example and an international example because we, we do see ourselves as an international company. Um, but because I'm a Jamaican and because this is a Jamaican business, I think we can have a massive impact. Our success can have a massive impact here locally uh, first. Yeah, great question. So first thing to note is that the FinTech space has been evolving, has been evolving before the pandemic. It's been evolving over the last 10 years, uh, 15 perhaps. Uh, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier, about that silo and, and the banks and financial services in general are trying over the last several years to close the gaps that existed because of those silos, right, that they started with. So that the digitization of, fin, of financial services, fintech as we know it, has been happening now for a while. Certainly the pandemic has accelerated a lot of the, the, the things that were uh, in progress. And I think the most important aspect of the pandemic has not been so much on the technology side, it's been more on the consciousness side, the consciousness of people their willingness to try new things, their willingness to accept things that just a few months before they were saying could never work. You know, like a lot of people, a lot of people were going to their, their managers and supervisors and saying, hey, can I work from home a few days? You know, I really, I think I could do better work. And their managers and, 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 and upline were saying, absolutely not, you know? And now <laughs> they're saying, please work from home. We'd love for you to work from home. And they're putting a budget behind it and all that. So. The first thing I think that has really uh, changed as a re result of the pandemic as it relates to FinTech is a renewed understanding and a broadening of the consciousness around the need for technology. There was always some interest, there was always some understanding that they needed it, but I think now there is a heightened understanding and there is an urgency behind it. Something that, you know, it, without the pandemic, I probably would have taken another decade to, to really get going. The other thing the pandemic has done as it relates to people, not technology per se, is that it has, I think it has accentuated the preferences that consumers have always had for convenience, 
right? We, banks especially have always bastardized this preference that consumers have had for convenience. Think about it. You, banks have one of the most restrictive opening hours of any business. They open at like 9.30 and close at 2.30, right? If you're really into customer service, you don't do that. If you're building a business around consumer convenience, you don't do that. Um, so I think finally, the consumers have gotten a big voice coming out of the pandemic. They have gotten a voice that says to all the financial services businesses, you must react and respect our preferences for convenience. And you see that happening now. You see banks and other financial services practitioners, you know, making a beeline for digital channels and making those digital channels very robust. And I think you'll see that happening uh, a lot more over the next several years. So I have this conversation with potential customers every day. You know, what makes us different? Because when you're in the technology space, you have a tendency to believe that the technology is your differentiator, but it's not. And I've never believed that. I've, I've always believed that anybody can build a feature in a software. If you understand how it works, you can build it. So this, the feature can never be your, you know, the point of differentiated value. It will never give you sustainable differentiation. So what will? I think what ultimately, what I think consumers are ultimately looking for is not just technology, they're looking for partnership. The, the days when you buy technology from someone and the person you bought it for was gone about their business, they got their money and you now are stuck with your technology, those days are long gone, right? Because businesses and financial services rely so much on technology now, they need a company, they need part people who are gonna see them and see the relationship through the prism of partnership. And that means an entirely different way of doing business than when you're just about product movement, just selling the product and, getting, and going away. So what makes us different is the fact that we bring partnership to our customers. We bring a spirit of partnership and our entire business model, even in the way we make money, is based upon the success of our customers. You don't see that a lot, where, com where companies align their success with the very success of their customers. So if the customer is not doing well, we don't do well. And if the customer is doing well, then we do exceptionally well. And so that model, I think, underscores our commitment, not just in words, but in deeds and in our business model, where we are really about partnering with our customers so that we're always there for them as they go through this sometimes very, um, not just difficult and complex, but you know, opaque and vague and unknowing uh, journey of, of digital transformation. Uh, they need a partner that will be there for them. And so that's what we're about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Um, the first advice I'd give to my younger self is to tell my younger self that you're right. The things that you value, your belief in value itself, because I've always believed in value. I've always believed that uh, money is incidental to the, the creation of value. If you're not creating value, then money won't appear unless you steal it. So it, when you believe that from a very young age, um, you know, you go through a lot of things that sometimes make you question if that's true. And so what I would tell my younger self is that absolutely that's true, that don't waver, right? That's the first thing. And the second thing I would tell my younger self is, um, and this goes back to when I was in university, I, you know, I've always been a techie and I've always, you know, been involved in, in, the, in the internet and stuff like that. But if I could go back into the early 90s, I would tell myself to double down on everything I saw in the internet space. Um, so that's what I would have done. 